two weeks ago, we covered the fall of the last key cities and airfields in Borneo, the Celebes and the Moluccas. From the airfield of Kandari II alone, the Japanese had already achieved their goal of having the necessary range to successfully conduct air operations over Java. Yet to be completely certain that their most important offensive was going to come to fruition, the Japanese commanders had decided that they first wanted to take southern Sumatra and the important airfield of Palembang. Last week, we also saw the Japanese pierce the melee barrier for the first time, with the capture of Singapore. And today, they turn to Burma, to start their advance on one of the most important British ports in Southeast Asia, Rangoon. Join us as the Empire of the Rising Sun commences the invasions of Burma and Sumatra. Clearly, conquest is a pretty uncertain way to grow a state's wealth. But for you, there's a much safer option, thanks to the sponsor of this video, Masterworks.io. At an estimated value of $1.7 trillion, projected to increase by another $900 billion over the next four years, art can make for a lucrative investment, usually reserved for those with the immense wealth needed to enter the market in the first place. Instead, Masterworks, an art investment platform, allows you to buy shares in art pieces, ultimately allowing you to receive a return when they're sold. Art prices are up 164% from 1995 to 2021, while key market analysts such as Morningstar expect returns of 5% or less in the stock market, making art a great place to diversify your portfolio. In 2020, they sold a Banksy, returning 32% to their investors. You can get started by just making an account on their site to choose your investments, and once registered, you can use their secondary internal market, where you can buy and sell art shares among other Masterworks investors, similar to stock trading on Robinhood. There's a waitlist for making these fine art investments, but use our link in the description to skip it and start immediately. Plus, it supports our channel, so check it out. As we've covered previously, General Imamura had appointed the 38th Division of Lieutenant General Sano Tadayoshi to conduct the invasion of Sumatra. After their successful capture of Hong Kong, the division had advanced into Kamran Bay by January 24th, while the 3rd Air Force had been executing air raids over Sumatra's main airfields since late December. Furthermore, Japanese forces had also occupied the Anambas Islands on January 26th to set up air bases for conducting the Sumatra and Java operations. This was because the invaders were planning to parachute a regiment of paratroopers over the key Palembang airfield, while the bulk of the 38th Division landed at Banka Island and navigated up the Muzi, Saleh and Talang rivers to support the attack on Palembang. Once Palembang was finally in Japanese hands, the invaders then planned to swiftly seize the Matapura and Tanjung Karang airfields as well as the oil installations around Talangabab and Limau. The first landings would be carried out by a two-battalion strong advance party that departed Kamran Bay on February 9th, with the rest of the division following them two days later to ascend the Musi River and join the battlefield. The 38th's landings were to be supported by a strong fleet commanded by Vice Admiral Ozawa Jizaburo, mainly consisting of six cruisers and 11 destroyers from the 2nd Fleet and the Southern Expeditionary Fleet. On the other side, the Dutch counted with four territorial commands on the island of Sumatra, under the overall control of Major General Rolof Overacker. In South Sumatra in particular, Lieutenant Colonel Vokosang had at his disposal about 2,000 men at Palembang, with a further two companies at Jambi, some 2,000 British reinforcements, and the support of 15 Hurricanes, 35 Hudsons, and 40 Blenheims from the RAF. Although a parachuting operation was not expected, the Dutch, led by Admiral Helfrich, were expecting a naval invasion, so Admiral Dorman's ABDA striking force was ordered to Orsthaver with the objective of intercepting the invasion fleet. On February 14th, with reports of Azawa's convoy approaching southern Sumatra, Helfrich ordered Dorman to depart Orsthaver and carry out a decisive attack on the invaders. But at the same time, the Japanese paratroopers, led by Colonel Kume Seichi, finally started dropping over the Palambang airfield, covered by elements of the 3rd Air Division. Despite the slow speed of the Japanese Ki-56 transports and the vigilant patrols of the RAF, 
the invaders achieved complete surprise in their paratrooper operation, aided by the dense smoke of the burned oil fields of Borneo and the Celebes. By midday, 180 men had been dropped into the airfield, with a further 90 men coming down on the oil refineries of Plajoa. While strafing the Dutch anti-aircraft defences, Japanese planes also dropped weapons, ammunition and other equipment for the paratroopers to employ. Benefiting from the close air support, Kume's men quickly engaged and defeated waves of Dutch soldiers, inflicting heavy casualties on them and successfully capturing the Joe's oil refineries. Yet the fighting was bitter nonetheless, with staunch resistance from the defenders that tenaciously held on to the airfield. By midnight, however, the airfield would also fall into the hands of the invaders, causing General Uvaraka to order a general retreat towards Osthaver, from where they would be evacuated. At this point, the advance party of the 38th Division had also entered the Mentok anchorage, with one battalion heading towards Banka Island and the rest of the party approaching the coast of Sumatra. Meanwhile, in the early hours of February 15th, Baz Luck struck Dorman's striking force as the Dutch destroyer Van Ghent ran aground in the Stolza Strait and was lost due to the damage suffered. A couple of hours later, Dorman also lost the element of surprise when they were sighted by a Japanese float plane from the carrier Chokai. Air attacks soon followed, with Dorman recalling the outcome of the Battle of Makassar Strait and ordering his forces to pull back. While they retreated, Japanese bombers continued to drop bombs over the Allied fleet, but at the end of the day, only minor damage would be inflicted on the Allied vessels. This was, however, Dorman's second defeat at the hands of Japanese air power, leaving the Japanese invasion fleet unimpeded to proceed with its plans. In the meantime, 60 more paratroopers were dropped over Palembang to reinforce the Japanese forces, which were conducting mopping up operations and were consolidating their gains. While the advance party successfully seized Mentok and its airfield, and under a rain of fire and bombs dropped upon them by the RAF aircraft, then started to ascend the Musi, Teleng and Sala rivers en route to its objectives. Thus the invaders rapidly got to Palembang and successfully made contact with the paratrooper force. At this point, Kume and his men had advanced into the city of Palembang, and by nightfall, the 38th soldiers would help him secure the city. On the next day, contact would also be made with Plajoa's oil refineries, and the main strength of the 38th Division would finally arrive at the mouth of the Musi River. But meanwhile, General Sano ordered the Tanaka detachment of the advance party to advance south towards Tanjung Karang. Departing on February 17th, the Japanese quickly seized the Talangjima oil field, but their advance was bogged down by the swamp forests of the region. By February 19th, units of the Tanaka detachment managed to capture the Matapura airfield after a minor engagement, then continued their advance with haste. That same day, the Japanese had also completed their conquest of Banka Island, while Sano sent the Kanki detachment to capture Lahat and Benkalu, and one infantry company to advance against Jambi. By dawn on February 20th, the Japanese had crossed the Manda River and had gotten to Tanjung Garang. But despite their efforts, most of the Dutch defenders had been evacuated from Oosthaver on February 17th. The invaders could only catch a glimpse of the rearguard of the defenders as they sailed away on two gunboats. The Tanjung Karang airfield would be captured on February 21st at long last, then being quickly put to work for air operations against Java. On this day, the Kanki detachment also departed Palembang and captured Lahat on the 22nd, Lubuklingao on the 23rd, and after crossing a mountain range, Benkulu on the west coast on the 24th. Jambi would finally fall into Japanese hands on March 4th, concluding the invasion of southern Sumatra. The operation had been a huge success for the Japanese Empire, capturing several airfields and oil refineries that could further aid the war machine of the rising sun. Although most of these were in a pretty bad state, the invaders would quickly set out to repair them so that they could put them to use for the empire. The Japanese were also planning the invasions of Bali and Timor, the last of Java's Dahor, before the main operation of the Dutch East Indies campaign. Although we'll cover Timor in more detail next week, 
The capture of Bali was assigned to the Kanemura Detachment, consisting of a battalion of the 48th Division under Commander Kanemura Matabe. They had travelled to Makassar by February 15th, from where they would finally depart three days later, escorted by a support fleet consisting of the cruiser Nagara and some seven destroyers. Concurrently, when Admiral Helfrich discovered that the objective of the invaders was Bali, he quickly met with Dorman on February 18th and devised a very flawed plan for a counterattack. Since the vessels at the disposition of the Dutch admirals were scattered and coming from different bases, the plan was for the attack to develop in three stages, with each group attacking separately against what they believed was a large Japanese force. In all fairness, instead of a counterattack, this plan looked more like a raid. But despite their hastiness to stop the invasion, the Japanese had already entered the Sano Anchorage by midnight, successfully landing on Bali in the early hours of February 19th and jeopardizing the entire point of the Allied attack. Upon landing, the Kanemura detachment headed westward under heavy rain and quickly seized the Denpasar barracks and the Kuta airfield almost without resistance. This effectively neutralized the Allied presence in Bali and the key town of Singaraja would finally fall a week later. But on that day, while the main naval force stood by for support on the sea east of Sepanjang Island, four Japanese destroyers of the 8th Destroyer Division and the troop transports got attacked by a relentless aerial bombardment that hindered their efforts and damaged one of the transports. In fear of losing it, the destroyers Arashio and Michishio escorted it back to Makassar, while the destroyers Asashio and Oshio remained in the Seno anchorage until disembarkation was completed and finally departed after dark. These two destroyers were about to face the first group of the Abda striking force. Shortly before midnight, Dorman deployed his two cruisers and four destroyers on the Badun Strait, ordering the cruisers to engage with gunfire and the destroyers to then attack with torpedoes. This was a poor plan, and it was also poorly executed due to the slowness to fire of the Dutch cruisers, with one of them not even opening fire. In the ensuing firefight, the Asashio was hit on her searchlight, but she also quickly scored a hit on the cruiser Java, causing some minor damage. This prompted the Dutch cruisers to race off to the north and break contact. Afterwards, the Japanese were engaged by the Allied destroyers, which caused heavy damage on the troop transport, but the Asashio yet again saved the day, isolating the Dutch destroyer Pete Hain with great technique and mercilessly sinking her enemy. After the demise of the Pete Hain, the firefight continued, but neither side hit the other again, and in the end, the Allied destroyers escaped to the southeast. Now it was the turn of the second group, but the Japanese were to be reinforced by the Arashio and Michishio returning from Makassar. Four destroyers and one cruiser entered the Badung Strait and started to fire torpedoes against the anchorage, where they believed the enemy would be. At this point, the main Japanese naval force had also been alerted and the Nagara was steaming to the area. But meanwhile, the Asashio and Oshio spotted the American destroyers and quickly engaged them in an intense firefight which saw the Stuart getting severely hit and damaged. The result was pandemonium. Parrot nearly plowed into Stuart, which was leading the destroyers, while John D. Edwards avoided Parrot only by making a hard turn to starboard. The Japanese destroyers then shifted their attention to the cruiser Tromp, pounding the Dutch vessel and causing extensive fires. In return, Tromp scored a hit on the bridge of the Oshio and also inflicted heavy damage on her. The Asashio took a single hit forward on her bridge that killed seven of her crew. As a result, all three ships then broke contact. And to the north, the Arashio and Michishio were caught by surprise by the American destroyers, suffering a deadly crossfire that caused huge damage on the Michishio. The Tromp also turned to her and scored a tremendous hit on her engine room, which caused her to stop. But before finishing the Michishio off, the Allies promptly disengaged and escaped to the northeast. Eight torpedo boats of the third group then entered the scene, but they would never get into attack position and would have to return to Sorabaja without achieving anything. All, all, the small Japanese destroyer division had fended off Dorman's attack admirably 
and had even inflicted more casualties than the attackers, sinking one destroyer and severely damaging the Tromp and the Stuart, which would later have to be scuttled after an accident in a repairing dock. Yet again, Dorman failed to score a local victory against the IJN due to his poor planning and ineffectiveness. Now we turn to Burma, where we had left off Brigadier Smythe on the Bilin River, unable to further retreat to some better defensive position behind the Sitang River due to the refusal of General Hutton. Brigadier Smythe would call it a disastrous decision. Back on February 6th, while General Wavell visited Burma and encouraged the defenders to take back all the lost territory, the Japanese 33rd Division of Lieutenant General Sakurai Shozo had crossed into Burma to the north of Mulmain to cover the flanks of the 55th Division. With his flank now secured, General Ida decided to continue his invasion of Burma on February 7th. From Mulmain, he first set out to cut off the two Indian battalions that still resisted at Martaban. In response, the defenders attempted a bayonet charge against the roadblock and subsequently marched through difficult terrain for two days. Then, from February 10th onwards, Ida sent his forces on several night assaults against Indian forces at the Kuzek Pa'an area. Despite the brave resistance of the Indians, by the morning of February 12th, the invaders began to get the upper hand and successfully pushed back the defenders. This left Smythe's position at the Bilin River extremely vulnerable, and the Japanese general quickly set out to exploit this. On February 13th, the 214th Regiment advanced rapidly across the Bilin River some 10 kilometers north of Bilin town, while the 215th Regiment outflanked the Indian positions at Duyanzaik to cross the river at Yinon. Although reinforced by the 48th Indian Brigade, Smythe's forces were in bad shape and were widely outnumbered by the two Japanese divisions. A series of confused skirmishes and fierce jungle fighting ensued in the following days, with the 214th trying to break through the Indian defences, but to no avail, as Smythe's men were still holding their ground by February 18th. On that same day, though, the British commander discovered that enemy forces were threatening to outflank him, so he committed his last reserves to contain the invaders, while Hutton himself travelled to the front lines to assess the situation. The next day, seeing that the enemy had advanced in full strength, Hutton reluctantly gave permission to withdraw to the Sitang River. Under the cover of darkness, Smythe rapidly began moving his forces towards the Sitang Bridge, with the 16th and 48th Indian Brigades marching to Kyagto, the first step of the 48-kilometer difficult retreat through thick jungle. Just like Hutton's decision to stay at the Billion River, this retreat would turn out to be a disaster. Next week, we'll cover the Battle of the Sitang Bridge in Burma and the continuation of the Dutch East Indies campaign with the invasion of Timor and the crucial Battle of the Java Sea. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.